When Bill Shipley set off from his home in the small rural community of Goldsby, Oklahoma, no one thought much of it. A painter by trade, Bill often traveled out of state on contract jobs and could be gone for weeks or even months at a time. In July of 2011, he had a multi-state trip mapped out which would carry him through Kansas, Missouri, and Texas, so no one thought much about it when they didn't hear from Bill. However, after nearly a month of silence and unreturned messages, his parents grew worried and decided to drop by and see what was going on. What they found would forever alter the course of their lives. Bill's home had been left unlocked, and inside was total disarray. Drawers were dumped out, food rotted in the refrigerator, and on the bed lay Bill's suitcase, packed but left behind. Soon, the Shipleys learned that not only had no one seen their son in weeks, but he'd never arrived at his painting jobs either. His clothes and his work computer were left behind, but his two trucks were mysteriously missing. When deputies with the McLean County Sheriff's Office got involved, they found themselves weeks behind on a case that was quickly growing cold. Eventually, they'd form a timeline, which followed the missing man's last known movements through his bank, his phone, his credit cards, and assorted surveillance cameras in the area. Conflicting information would soon reveal that not only had Bill Shipley gone missing, but in his absence, someone had stolen both of his trucks and much of his pricey painting equipment. At the same time, an unknown man had been using Bill's credit card throughout the area, at a store, a gas station, and a restaurant. Surveillance video captured the man, but to this day, he has never been positively identified and remains the only person of interest. So what happened to Bill Shipley? Was he the victim of a random crime perpetrated by someone who was hoping to get their hands on some fast cash? Was the missing man purposefully targeted, perhaps by someone he believed he could trust? And just who is this unknown man using Bill's credit cards up until the very day that he was reported missing? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 236, The Disappearance of Bill Dwayne Ship. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious 2011 disappearance of Bill Dwayne Shipley from Goldsby, Oklahoma. Before jumping into the case, just a quick reminder that I will once again be representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row at CrimeCon this year. CrimeCon takes place in Nashville, Tennessee on the weekend of May 31st through June 2nd. As always, I'm excited to meet and chat with all of you there. So if you're planning to attend and you haven't yet purchased your pass, use promo code TRACE to save 10%. That's CrimeCon.com promo code TRACE. I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. It's been nearly 13 years since Bill Shipley mysteriously vanished in the summer of 2011, and it appears at this point that investigators are no closer to finding answers or Bill himself. This is episode 236, The Disappearance of Bill Dwayne Shipley. Forty-seven year old Bill Dwayne Shipley was a quiet, hardworking, and friendly guy living in the small town of Goldsby, Oklahoma. He'd been in Oklahoma in his entire life, born on Thursday, March 19, 1964, in Cleveland County to parents William and Patricia, he lived a quiet and unassuming life. Bill's younger sister and his only sibling, Valerie, would later describe her brother as a regular guy, an ordinary man who was dedicated to his work. He had a passion for cars and working on engines. He loved watching NASCAR and sometimes traveled to major events. He was an intelligent, kind, and compassionate man, the type of person you could feel comfortable going to with a problem or in search of advice. He attended Moore High School and then followed that up by attending a technical school, as his interests had always been more in working with his hands rather than reading classic literature. He liked to be involved, to get grease up to his elbows, and to take something that refused to run and to get it humming. Little has been reported about the vast majority of his life. He was somewhat of a private person and preferred to keep things in-house. 
He had no children and never married, though no one can say with any certainty if he'd ever wanted those things to begin with. To those who knew him, he was happy with life and enjoyed his work, and he definitely had plenty of work to keep him busy. Operating as a contract painter, Bill's work was tight, efficient, and professional. He earned praise for the jobs he had performed, and eventually, he started his own business and watched it flourish. He was doing well financially, but really struck pay dirt when he was offered a long-term contract from Arby's, a fast food restaurant chain. The company hired Bill to be their primary painter in Oklahoma and surrounding states, so each summer, he'd embark upon long series of trips where he'd paint newly constructed and remodeled Arby's stores throughout Texas, Missouri, and Kansas, to name just a few. Frequently traveling out of state for his painting jobs, Bill took extremely well to his nomad-like existence and loved being able to visit other places and live there for weeks at a time as he worked on a project. While business was booming, Bill's social life was rather quiet. He didn't keep a wide circle of friends, but he didn't spend all of his free time alone either. He was close with his parents and sister, and while he wasn't the type to call daily or even weekly, he always maintained contact in one form or another. Whenever he headed out on another trip for work, he notified his parents of his plans, his destinations, and when he figured he'd return. While on the road, he called once or maybe twice a month to see what was new in the check-in, but he enjoyed his free time and being out on his own. According to friends, Bill was a polite and happy guy who didn't have too many complaints outside of the normal struggles everybody deals with. Being alone afforded Bill the ability to spend his money as he saw fit, and he mostly just poured it back into his business, purchasing top-quality equipment and painting supplies. He owned two trucks, both of them painted in shades of deep red. There was his work truck, a 1988 Jeep Comanche with a ladder rack. Then there was his everyday truck, a 2002 Chevrolet S14 extended cab 4x4. Since Bill spent so much of his life on the road, he didn't see the logic in putting down a lot of money on a house that he'd only be in for half the year at best. Instead, he purchased a fifth-wheel trailer. Essentially, it's like a large RV or motorhome, but without the motor. It doesn't have an engine and instead can be towed, thus making Bill's truck the fifth wheel. For long trips for pleasure or for work, this afforded Bill the ability to take his home right along with him, but most of the time he left it behind in lot number 104 of the Adkins Hill Mobile Home Park, located at 1269 North Adkins Hill Road. While the address of the mobile home park is listed as being in the city of Norman, the seat of Cleveland County, the park is actually located southwest from city lines across the Canadian River in the small town of Goldsby, home to, at the time, less than 2,000 residents. So small is Goldsby, in fact, that it doesn't have its own post offices or schools and falls instead within the districts of a neighboring city to the south, Washington. Despite its sparse population, Goldsby is home to one major draw in the area, and that is the Riverwind Casino. Opened in 2006, the 219,000-square-foot casino is owned and operated by the Chickasaw Nation and offers not just a mecca for gambling, but also two restaurants, a lounge, food court, multiple bars, and a 1,500-seat theater that holds concerts. Riverwind would become an area that Bill frequented as the casino compound is located just two and a half miles northwest of the mobile home park. As the spring of 2011 slowly made the transition to summer, things were about to pick up for the 47-year-old. With fall and winter being slow months for his painting business, he hadn't been up to a whole lot recently. His family noted he'd spent the previous few months relaxing and taking things easy, but with Summer's arrival, he started making plans and preparations for his Arby's contract. Receiving his marching orders in early July, Bill was prepared to spend much of the next two months on the road as he was assigned to paint restaurants in three states. First, he'd head east to Arkansas, then north to Missouri, and west to Kansas before completing the circle and returning south to Oklahoma. According to Bill's father, William, he and his wife Patricia last heard from their son on Friday, July 15th. Reportedly, Bill seemed to be in a good mood and nothing stood out as unusual or a cause for concern during the call. 
Bill explained his schedule over the next few weeks and the locations he'd be traveling to. The family has stated that Bill always told them where and when he would be traveling, and that usually meant they wouldn't be hearing from him for several weeks. Reportedly, Bill was planning to leave town around Tuesday the 19th. However, he never made it to his first job. In fact, there's no evidence at all to suggest that Bill Shipley was even alive after the 19th. But because of his tendency towards intermittent phone calls, no one would notice anything was wrong for almost a month. William and Patricia first got the inkling that something wasn't right a little less than a week after Bill was set to have left town. While not a frequent caller, Bill never reached out on his father's birthday, and that was something that stood out. He was good about keeping track of birthdays and holidays and always called, even if briefly, to chat on special occasions. They didn't take the lack of a call as a major sign that something was wrong. They knew Bill could get busy while he was on the road and things could slip his mind, but it was the first domino to fall. Over the course of the next two weeks, they made multiple attempts to contact him, but never got an answer or a call back. After speaking to his sister, Valerie, they learned that she had last spoken to him on the 4th of July. That meant, as far as the family could confirm, no one had spoken to or seen Bill since their last call on the 15th. Their sinking feelings, frustration, and concern grew to an unmanageable point. And on Sunday, August 14th, nearly a full month since they'd last spoken to their son, William and Patricia decided to travel to the mobile home park to find out when exactly he'd left and whether or not any of his neighbors had seen or heard from him. Instead, the couple would be confronted by a scene which was as upsetting as it was inexplicable. While both of Bill's trucks were mysteriously missing, his trailer was still sitting in lot number 104. The sidewall was still expanded, which was strange because Bill always closed it before traveling. William and Patricia truly started worrying when they found the door to the trailer unlocked, a big no-no in Bill's world. Even if he were planning to travel without his trailer, Bill always closed it up and locked it securely before leaving town. Entering the trailer, William quickly was overwhelmed by the smell of rotting food. Opening the fridge, he found it filled with spoiled groceries. None of the lights worked, and William quickly determined that the power to the camper had been shut off due to his son's failure to pay the bill that month. Searching around, William noted that all of his son's work clothes were still there, along with a laptop computer that Bill used for work. Entering the bedroom, he found complete disarray. Dresser drawers were left open, much of their contents dumped out on the floor. On the bed, there was a packed suitcase, but it appeared that something had happened to the 47-year-old before he could leave with it. In addition to the disturbing and disheveled way in which the trailer had been left, perhaps one of the most concerning discoveries was that of Bill's beloved cat. The animal had clearly been left without food or water for what appeared to have been weeks and had nearly died from starvation. Bill loved his pets and treated them extremely well, so seeing the cat in that condition sent up immediate red flags. While William and Patricia had gone to the mobile home park assuming they'd find an easy explanation for their son's lack of contact, instead, they were confronted by the horrible reality that their son was missing, or perhaps worse. Outside of the fifth-wheel trailer, William discovered that Bill's shed had also been left unlocked, something his son would never do. After speaking with some neighbors and learning that no one had seen Bill around since the time of the 19th, his parents decided their best course of action would be to contact investigators and report him missing. The report was taken by an official with the McLean County Sheriff's Office, and detectives were dispatched to the mobile home park where they planned to examine the trailer and speak with neighbors in an effort to determine what might have happened. As soon as they entered, they agreed with the Shipley family that something was definitely wrong. While they could find nothing which they believed indicated any type of a struggle or crime had been committed inside of the trailer, something was definitely out of the ordinary. Police recovered an ATM receipt, dated July 19th, which showed a bank balance of more than $7,000. That date became even more important when investigators were informed that it appeared the 19th was also the last day Bill had picked up his mail, which, nearly a month later, was overflowing. 
The ATM receipt also showed that Bill had made a large withdrawal on the 19th, totaling between three and $4,000. However, there was no sign of the money or Bill, nor any indication of where he may have gone. While investigators ultimately spoke with every person living in the mobile home park, they found that most of them didn't know Bill beyond a polite wave from time to time, and no one seemed to possess any information about the last time he was actually seen. One neighbor, who has gone unidentified, apparently told investigators that, as best she could recall, she had last seen Bill approximately three to four weeks earlier, which would match up with his presumed date of disappearance being the 19th. While she didn't have anything out of the ordinary or unusual to report about Bill specifically, she had noticed some strange things around his property. According to the witness, both of Bill's trucks were parked on his lot, those being the 88 Jeep Comanche and the 02 Chevy 4x4, both of which are deep shades of red. However, this witness told detectives that sometime between a week and 10 days after she last saw Bill, she came home one day and noticed that the Chevy was gone and it never came back. Not thinking too much about it, her attention was caught a week or so later when she looked outside and noticed that now the Jeep was also missing. She apparently didn't see anyone in the area, nor did she witness the vehicles being driven away, but she did find it odd that they had disappeared separately a week or so apart and she hadn't seen Bill at all. Going through the home, no forensic evidence was recovered, and investigators later noted that they hadn't seen so much as a drop of blood to suggest anything happened in the trailer. While investigators didn't find any solid evidence that Bill had been the victim of a violent crime, or perhaps any crime, there was enough about the way his home was left and his lack of contact for them to strongly state their belief that Bill had likely been the victim of foul play. In hopes of determining what might have happened and where Bill might be, police decided they needed to follow several different avenues. Firstly, they reached out to the Arby's Corporation, who were able to confirm that Bill had never arrived for any of his scheduled painting jobs and that they had been unable to reach him over the previous weeks. Next, they issued bolos for both trucks. Images of the vehicles, their license plate numbers, and descriptions were issued to local and surrounding law enforcement as well as the media. The hope was that the sooner they could get Bill's story out there and pictures of him and his trucks, the better their chances might be of locating him or maybe a leading clue. They also filed warrants to obtain Bill's cell phone, call, messaging, and location data, as well as access to his bank accounts and credit cards. Their focus was on July 19th and the days following it, as they hoped to be able to assemble some form or fashion of a timeline. Determining where Bill had been and what he had done leading up to his disappearance might give them a direction to start looking. Working off of the ATM receipt found in the home, police tracked it to Bill's bank, local in Goldsby, and managed to obtain surveillance footage which showed the 47-year-old making the large withdrawals. For some reason, this footage doesn't appear to be available publicly, so it's difficult to verify, but investigators have said there didn't appear to be anything unusual about this activity. Normally, in a missing person's case, this kind of large cash withdrawal might stand out, but in Bill's case, it's a little different. After taking out between three and $4,000, Bill proceeded over to a Norman area paint store where he purchased approximately $3,000 in paint supplies for his Arby's job. Among the items purchased were cans of red and white paint, the colors used at the restaurant chain. Lieutenant Dan Huff, a spokesperson for the sheriff's office, would later state, quote, He bought some painting supplies to complete the job, but those supplies, Mr. Shipley, and a substantial sum of money has seemed to vanish. Certainly there is the possibility that Mr. Shipley was abducted and robbed, but our hope right now is to find Mr. Shipley, end quote. After making this purchase, police report there was an outgoing call made on Bill's cell phone at approximately 5 p.m. Whether or not they know the context of the call or the person to who the call was made is unknown, as investigators have never offered up any additional details about this call. The final sighting of Bill takes place not long after the 5 p.m. call. Surveillance cameras at a Sonic fast food restaurant located directly across Highway 9 from the Riverwind Casino, shows Bill pulling into the drive-thru with his red Chevy truck. 
Although no time has been given for this sighting, a quick look at the footage shows it's still bright and sunny out. The footage, which is grainy and pixelated as all hell, shows his truck pull up to the window at which point he pays for his order. It is extremely difficult to tell, but investigators have stated that there is an unknown individual in the passenger seat of the truck. According to the receipt data obtained from Sonic, it was confirmed that Bill purchased two drinks, an iced tea with lemon, which his family says was his favorite, as well as a watermelon slushy, something his family says he would have never ordered for himself. The Sonic is located just two and a half miles northwest from the mobile home park. What exactly happened after this point has remained a mystery for closing in on 13 years at this point in time. It's believed that Bill at least made it home to his trailer that evening as his Sonic cup was found inside the home when police searched it. They've never been able to identify the person who was in the truck with him that day, but his family is convinced it has to be someone he knows, which makes it all the more confounding that the unidentified person has never come forward. Bill's sister, Valerie, later told the Purcell Register that it would have been completely out of character for her brother to give a ride to someone he didn't know, let alone to allow a stranger inside of his truck at all. The family is uncertain as to whether or not the person in the truck that day is connected to Bill's disappearance, but they do believe that individual could possess important information to insist investigators, even if they don't know it. Valerie noted that the unknown passenger could help fill in gaps about the day and evening leading up to the last time Bill was known to be alive. She explained, quote, that person, even if they had nothing, we would like for them to come forward. Did they see anything at the house? Did someone meet them? Where exactly did they go? End quote. Investigators stated at the time and in the years since that they were hoping the lab could enhance the video. However, if that ever occurred, which I can't confirm, an updated version of that footage has never been released, at least that I could find. Considering the large money withdrawal and the big purchase at the paint store, police began considering the possibility that someone might have noticed that Bill had a lot of money on him and planned to rob him. Family confirmed that he often carried a large amount of cash in a wad in his pocket and wasn't shy about pulling it out to make purchases. Investigators wondered if someone might have seen Bill flashing his cash and followed him home to the mobile home park. The problem was, not only did they find no hard evidence of a crime at Bill's home, there weren't any witnesses who saw strange people, heard strange sounds or yelling, or anything that would make it fit together. If anything, it appeared more likely that whoever was responsible for Bill's disappearance was likely someone he knew, whether that was on a personal or professional basis. A large-scale search was organized at the mobile home park, with Bill's trailer being at the center. The park is open to the west, facing towards North Adkins Hill Road, and the south, facing towards East Burr Oak Road. To the north and east, however, a thick tree line separates the park from a private road and residences to the north and a large farm to the east. Approximately one mile northeast of the park lies the Canadian River, the largest tributary of the Arkansas River. Running for more than 1,000 miles, the river twists and carves its way through Oklahoma, the Texas Panhandle, New Mexico, and Colorado. The land search yielded no results, not so much as a trace of Bill. Assuming the worst, cadaver dogs were also brought in to sweep through the park and the land surrounding Bill's home, but again, nothing was found. At the time, Investigators theorized that Bill might have been tricked into going down to the river, or might have been forcibly taken there, and that he was likely killed or dumped somewhere along the river, or perhaps had been placed into it. Despite exhaustive searches along the river banks and through the water, they could find nothing to indicate Bill had been there or that he had been killed in that area. In addition to these searches, advanced testing was done inside of Bill's trailer in a search for forensic evidence, in particular, bodily fluids, but again, nothing was found. It seemed apparent to investigators that whatever had happened to Bill, it had likely happened elsewhere. With nothing to work with or build on at the mobile home park, investigators turned their attention to what other information might yield clues or at least give them some indication of where to take their search. Examining Bill's cell phone data, they learned that the 5 p.m. call on the 19th was the last one made, 
Although seven days later on the 26th, someone had attempted to call the phone and it wasn't a member of the family. The call wasn't answered and whether or not police know who placed that call has never been revealed. This is the last activity on the phone and after the 26th, it appears to have either been powered off or broken. Police had the phone pinged and came to discover that it was last active in the Goldsby area. Unfortunately, they weren't able to exactly narrow it down. The pings showed that the phone was last used somewhere within a six-mile radius of Goldsby. This radius also covered parts of the cities of Norman and Noble, which essentially means the phone could have been used almost anywhere in a wide area. Lieutenant Dan Huff explained that the phone was used, quote, near Goldsby, about six miles to the north or south of Goldsby, anyway. It could have been used in Norman, end quote. So while they had hoped the phone might give them a direction, all it really did was confirm that they were within at least six miles of it, but to this day, Bill's phone has never been found. While the trail of the phone had unfortunately turned out to be a dead end, six days into the search for Bill, on Saturday, August 20th, investigators would get a major break. Nearly 20 miles north from the trailer park, Bill's red Jeep Comanche pickup truck was discovered abandoned in the parking lot of the Brookwood Village Apartments, not far from the intersection of Southwest 89th Street and South Walker Avenue. The Jeep was found parked in the lot, nearly up against a picket fence not far from the entrance. While the ladder rack was still present, jutting up from the bed of the truck, the ladder itself was missing. The bed of the truck was filled with paint cans, plastic wrap, and other painting supplies. However, when the family was shown the vehicle, they noted several things which were missing. Valerie would later explain the missing items, speaking to News on 6. She stated, quote, two airless sprayers. One was a Titan 440i, one was a 400 on a skid. He had professional ladders. He had purchased for his job the day before five-gallon paint that was red and Navajo white. Those were also taken, end quote. For the record, both of the airless sprayers today retail for between $900 and $1,200 a piece. At the time, Sheriff's Detective David Tompkins, one of the first assigned to the case, contacted local pawn shops and advised them to notify his office should any of these sprayers show up. Years later, he continues to periodically check in on pawn shops and reselling stores in the area, but Bill's equipment has never been located. In addition to the sprayers, paint supplies, and ladders, Valerie added that some lights were also missing from the Jeep. The vehicle was taken in and processed for potential evidence, and while fingerprints, hairs, and fibers were collected, they have no way to connect them to anyone without additional information. Presumably, the prints were run through the system and didn't return any matches, although this has never been specifically stated. What they were primarily looking for was evidence of a crime, namely blood, but none was found. Lieutenant Dan Huff explained, quote, we have processed it for fingerprints, hair, and fibers, and we're working on that now. We didn't locate any evidence at the scene that was dramatic to the visual eye. End quote. It appeared that while the Jeep had been taken and abandoned, no violent crime had occurred inside of the vehicle itself. Not much could be learned from the Jeep, sadly, and police found themselves almost reset back to square one. A full canvas of the apartment complex failed to turn up any witnesses who had seen who had been driving the Jeep, nor had anyone have an accounting for when the Jeep had arrived. While an exciting find and a break in the case, the Jeep did not provide any evidence of value nor new avenues to investigate. With one truck found, investigators doubled up their efforts to try and track down the other, the Chevy 4x4, hoping for more impactful results. In addition to their work, Bill's family had printed up thousands of missing persons flyers showing him and the still missing truck, and they plastered Goldsby, Norman, and surrounding areas with the flyers, putting them up in store windows, on poles and trees, and even in the windows of their own vehicles. Right when detectives were beginning to feel like the case was slipping away from them, they finally received paperwork from Bill's credit card company, and what it revealed was extremely curious. Just days prior to the family reporting Bill missing, someone had been using his credit card in both Norman and Oklahoma City. On Friday, August 12th, 
The credit card was used at a Murphy USA gas station located at 363 North Interstate Drive in Norman, approximately five miles north of Bill's home and directly off northbound exit 109 of I-35. That same day, the card was used again, this time at the Saltgrass Steakhouse in Norman, located at 650 North Interstate Drive off southbound exit 110B. The steakhouse is located just a mile and a half north and across I-35 from the Murphy gas station. The final charge revealed by investigators was made the next day, Saturday, August 13th, just one day before Bill's parents would report him missing. This time, the card was used at a Home Depot store in South Oklahoma City, located at 7400 South Shields Boulevard. This store is located 14 miles north of the steakhouse along I-35 and off exit 121B. Interestingly, if you follow the trail, the credit card moves north from Goldsby into Norman where two purchases are made. It then continues north along I-35 to where the final transaction is made at the Home Depot. Unfortunately, police have not revealed what was purchased at the Home Depot or the gas station, although presumably food was purchased at the steakhouse. What stands out, however, is that these charges begin just days before Bill is reported missing, not immediately following his disappearance. Then, after police arrive at Bill's home, the card's never used again. Both the family and investigators have speculated that it was possible the person using the card either kept eyes on the mobile home park or was connected to someone who lived there and stopped using the card once they learned that police had arrived to investigate the disappearance. Bill's father, William, explained to News on 6, saying, quote, His credit cards were run at several places, but it stopped at that time. Somebody saw someone was there. We are not going to stop. We are going to find the people that are involved in this. End quote. If there were additional charges made prior to the 12th, but after the 19th, police have never confirmed. While these charges are curious and show a northern pathway for the unknown person using them, it wasn't so much their use, but the locations themselves that would provide police with their biggest break to date. The gas station had several surveillance cameras, both inside and out. When police requested footage, they were excited to see that both sets of cameras had captured images of the man using Bill's card. Several frames show him walking past the gas pumps and entering the store. The same individual was captured a short time later on a security camera inside of the Saltgrass Steakhouse, although that footage is black and white. Police quickly released still frame images of the man and requested the public's assistance in identifying him. He is described as a white male around 50 years of age, standing 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighing around 250 pounds. He has a large stomach, light-colored eyes, and whitish or light-colored hair. In the footage, he was dressed in tan overalls, a white long sleeve shirt with a faint yellow grid check pattern, and two angled button-fold pockets on the right and left chest. He also wore dark brown western-style work boots and a green John Deere baseball cap. Police have theorized that the man made efforts to conceal his identity, noting that in some images he wears sunglasses and in others has his chin down so that the brim of his hat hides his full face. There's also mention of a towel or some similar object used to hide his face, but I've never seen that image nor learned where it was captured. However, a quick look at the photos doesn't necessarily translate to me that this guy's hiding anything. A large portion of his face is captured on film, and at least at the gas station, if he was trying to hide his identity, he did a really bad job. At the steakhouse, the camera is housed near the ceiling and angled down, and as a result, the brim of the cap hides his face from the nose up. While I agree it's frustrating to not get the full picture, this doesn't appear to be a concerted or masterminded effort to hide his identity. He's wearing a hat, and as a result, a camera above his head doesn't capture his face. It's pretty basic, to be honest, and there's another reason why I would argue that this is not some effort to hide his identity. The camera footage got such a good look at this guy's face that the police were able to put out and release an extremely detailed composite of what the man's face looks like without his sunglasses on. It's not your generic composite, 
where it could be almost anyone. It's distinct and looks as though someone actually sat for this portrait. Suffice it to say, if this was a person you knew in your day-to-day life, I don't think you'd have a moment's hesitation identifying him from the drawing or the still-framed images. Thinking along the same lines, police issued the sketch to the papers, local media, and had it added to missing persons flyers, which they posted all across the state. Once the image was circulated of a man they describe as a person of interest, Investigators expected to receive a number of calls from people explaining who they thought that man might be, but to their surprise, despite the media coverage, the surveillance footage, and the composite, they didn't get calls from anyone who claimed to know the man's identity. Speaking to the Norman transcript on August 25th, Lieutenant Dan Huff expressed investigators' frustration with how few calls they'd received. He explained, quote, We're not getting the response we'd usually get in a case like this. So far, we've gotten less than 10 tips. Usually, we'd get hundreds of them, even if a lot of them are nuisance calls. End quote. Because of the lack of calls, investigators began theorizing that since no one obviously recognized this man, he must not be from the area. Of course, if he wasn't, it's odd that he was still hanging around town using the missing man's credit card nearly a month after he disappeared. Strange behavior since it's usually customary for criminals to want to get away from the area, not linger for a month getting caught on numerous cameras using a missing and likely murdered man's credit cards. Interestingly, while this person of interest remains unidentified to this day, Detective Tompkins noted that he has a good idea who the man might be, but without corroborating evidence or information, he can't reveal the name publicly. So, is the man in fact local after all? Well, that remains to be seen. Sadly, by the end of August, the investigation into Bill's disappearance was already beginning to grow cold. Despite finding his missing Jeep and processing it, searching through his trailer and property, tracking his cell phone and credit cards, and releasing still images and a composite of the person of interest, investigators were not receiving any assistance from the public. Bill had indeed lived a predominantly quiet and private life, and it seemed apparent that not many people knew him or were familiar enough with him to offer much insight into what might have happened, anyone he may have had problems with, or any concerns he had for his own safety. They became more and more convinced that whoever was involved likely knew Bill, whether personally or through business. However, a search of his internet history opened up the door to a different possibility. Detectives found that Bill had an account with Craigslist, And a few weeks prior to his disappearance, he had made a post advertising that he was looking to hire a painter's helper. Police have never confirmed whether or not anyone replied directly to the post, but it's possible Bill could have spoken to someone, or more than one person, about the job opportunity. It's been theorized that someone might have responded to the post not looking for a job, but potentially searching for someone to rob or take advantage of. Living alone, running his own company, and known to carry large sums of cash on his person, Bill would have made an enticing target. Unfortunately, whether or not this angle of the investigation provided any true insight has never been stated, and this detail about Craigslist is often reported casually with no additional examination or follow-up. I know from searching myself that Bill had social media accounts prior to his disappearance, and one of them remains open an untouched glimpse into his life at the time surrounding his disappearance. It's flooded with pictures and posts, but curiously, there is no one on his friends list, no comments, likes, or anything from anyone other than Bill himself. The final post is dated July 8th, 2011, just 11 days before the 47-year-old vanished. It's a very unassuming page. There's nothing that really stands out about it, and certainly there doesn't appear to be anything connected to or suggesting anyone that Bill may have had problems with or been afraid of. By the end of 2011, things had begun fading out fairly quickly, and both investigators and the family hoped to keep the story in the headlines, to keep Bill's name and image at the forefront of the community's minds. But all the same, the case continued to slip. The family started offering rewards for information, $2,000, then $4,000. But despite the offers, police didn't see a major uptick in calls or tips. As for the family, someone called them twice from a local payphone to give information. 
What information was given, we don't know, and the family has since made pleas for the caller to call again. Valerie explained, quote, maybe they might have known more. They called twice and we ask again, call, just let us know. Even if it's just the smallest amount of things that we can grasp and hope to locate where Bill is at, end quote. Unfortunately, the last major update in this case came on Tuesday, August 14th, 2012, exactly one year to the day that Bill's parents searched his home and reported him missing. On that Tuesday morning, a manager employed at the East Lake Village Apartments noticed a truck in the parking lot that hadn't moved since she'd started working there. Tagging the truck, she contacted a tow truck company located in Moore, and they arrived to take the vehicle. At that point, the truck's VIN number and license plate were run through the system and kicked back that this was the missing truck of Bill Shipley. The apartment complex is located at 12901 Southwestern Avenue, placing it just shy of three miles south from the Brookwood Apartments where Bill's Jeep had been found a year earlier. Apparently, the East Lake Village Apartments at the time were a popular spot for members of the military to rent. As a result, it was extremely common for vehicles to remain in the parking lot, unmoved and untouched for several weeks or even months at a time, if a tenant were deployed or shipped elsewhere for service. As a result, no one knows for certain just how long Bill's truck had been parked there, but there's a very good chance it had been abandoned within days of the Jeep. The discovery of the Chevy 4x4 was heralded by investigators as a big break. It was the truck Bill was driving in the surveillance footage of Sonic, which means he drove it the last night he was known to be alive. Unfortunately, much like with the Jeep, while investigators pulled fiber, hair, and fingerprint evidence from the Chevy, it didn't connect them to any suspects or any new areas to investigate. Lieutenant Huff would later tell reporters, quote, it could come into play later, but right now, it's not helping us find Mr. Shipley, end quote. Another hopeful find turned into a disappointment for police and the family. The missing Chevy had been a key piece of the case they hoped would finally provide some answers, but as has been with so much of this case, it was another frustrating dead end. A few years back, Detective Tompkins added Bill to a deck of cards distributed to prisoners in the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. He is represented on the aid of clubs. A long shot, according to detectives, but you never know who might see that card and remember something. Tompkins, heartbroken for the family, maintains his hope that they will get some movement on the case. He stated, quote, It's still an active case. We have followed many leads, but they are dead-end leads. It's kind of disappointing we've not come up with him, his vehicle, or the property. So far, we have come up with nothing. End quote. In the nearly 13 years which have passed since Bill Shipley was last seen, time has moved forward for much of the world, but not for his parents or his sister. All these years later, they continue to hope to someday find the answers they have sought, to see justice done, and to be able to bring Bill home so they might lay him to rest. The family has a burial plot in a Shawnee area cemetery, and they have erected a stone for Bill. It shows his birth date but no date of death. Two cross checkered flags are engraved on the stone, and at the top it reads, Beloved Son and Brother. A quote, apparently one of Bill's favorites, spans the bottom of the stone, reading, I would rather walk with God in the dark than go alone in the light. When last seen, Bill Dwayne Shipley was described as being a white male with brown hair and blue eyes, standing five feet nine inches tall, and weighing approximately 175 pounds. Bill wears wire-framed prescription glasses. His shoe size is 8.5 or 9. His shirt size is large or extra large, and his pant size is 34 or 36. He has not been seen nor heard from since Tuesday, July 19, 2011, and is a former resident of the Atkin Hill Mobile Home Park in Goldsby. A reward remains available for information leading to his location. Bill was 47 years old at the time of his disappearance, and if alive today, would be turning 60 next month. In addition, 
Police would like to speak with the person who was using Bill's credit card in the Norman and Oklahoma City areas in the days leading up to him being reported missing. This man is described as a white male with light hair and eyes standing six foot two inches tall and weighing approximately 250 pounds. He has a large stomach, medium complexion, and when captured on surveillance video was wearing brown overalls, a white grid check pattern shirt, brown western style work boots, and a green John Deere hat. There are many images of him available, including a highly detailed composite. Believed to be 50 at the time, he would be in his early 60s today. Bill Shipley was a quiet, unassuming man who lived a simple life. He loved his family, fixing engines, watching NASCAR, and painting. He was a reliable man, a responsible and skilled employee, a beloved and cared for son and brother. He is missed and will continue to be missed for so long as those who love him are here to remember the good times and the happy moments. But their road has been difficult and filled with broken dreams and dashed hopes. Asked about the search for Bill more than a decade later, his sister Valerie simply replied, quote, It's something I would not want to wish on anybody. My parents have been through so much pain and so much heartache. Every day, it's in our minds. Every day. Thirteen years ago, Bill Shipley mysteriously vanished from his Goldsby area home and has never been located. His trucks have been found, his credit cards tracked, his phone analyzed, but none of this led investigators any closer to finding out not only what happened to him, but who was responsible. A series of still images from surveillance cameras depict an unidentified man who was apparently using Bill's credit cards right up until the day he was reported missing and then... With no explanation, the purchases stop. The card is never used again, and despite an exhaustive media campaign, the older, farmer-looking man has remained unidentified. This man might possess answers that could finally help police to figure out what went down, but somehow no one recognizes him. Maybe all of you could help. If you wouldn't mind, please share the flyer showing this unknown man on social media. I'll provide a link to it right in the show notes. Someone out there knows who he is, and if enough eyes can get on that flyer, maybe someone will finally submit the tip that breaks everything open. Now, I fully admit that Bill's case is one of the more frustrating ones I've ever worked on. Usually it's tough because there's no information, no suspects, no crime scene, and you're essentially stuck in the dark trying to find a black string on a dirty rug. Here, though, it's actually more frustrating because of all of the evidence available. Both of Bill's trucks were recovered and processed. The photographs of the person of interest using Bill's credit card that are so sharp and clear an artist was able to create a finely detailed composite image, and yet no one's come forward to identify him. Trust me, if you knew this guy, you'd recognize him in a heartbeat. So he's either a ghost or there's people who know his name but have elected not to share it. And as a result, a family suffers needlessly grasping its straws for a lost son and brother. Taking a look at the case, there have only ever been two real theories suggested by investigators. Both of them refer to foul play as no one associated with the case believes there's a chance of finding Bill out there alive after all this time. While technically a missing persons case, it maintains that definition only due to a lack of proof that Bill has been the likely victim of a homicide. Investigators believe that sometime during the evening of July 19th, 2011, one or more individuals were present at the mobile home park and that somewhere between his fifth wheel trailer and the Canadian River to the northeast, Bill was the victim of a violent crime. It's also possible that the crime occurred elsewhere, perhaps at a location Bill was lured to, but no one can say for certain. The one question that really burns up detectives and the family is who could have been involved? It's believed that the suspect or suspects, as police theorize more than one person, likely knew Bill in some way. They could have been acquaintances, friends, or perhaps people he worked with previously. On the other hand, many have considered the possibility that since the man in the photos has never been identified, and no one who knew Bill seems to have any helpful information, that just maybe it could have been a random crime. And perhaps that is what has made it so difficult to crack. 
In an effort to save both time and compare things more accurately, I think we'll run through the two theories side by side and see what makes the most sense, if anything does. We know that Bill last spoke to his family on the 14th, five days before he's believed to have gone missing. No one can say for sure that the 19th is in fact the day he disappeared, but it's the last day he's seen around town and the last day he picks up his mail. So presumably, he disappears sometime between 5 p.m. on the 19th when he makes that last call from his cell phone and 5 p.m. on the 20th. There's really not enough relevant information to narrow it down further than that. Every one of Bill's trackable movements from his stop at the bank to the paint store to the Sonic drive-in all happen on the 19th. For the most part, it's what you'd expect. Bill goes to the bank, takes out some cash, hits up the paint store, and buys supplies for his upcoming work. The first curious moment comes when he pulls around in the Sonic drive through with an unidentified passenger. Now, I've watched this security footage more times than I can count, and it's absolutely atrocious. Frankly, I can't even tell who's in that truck, let alone if there's a passenger. Seemingly, police confirm the passenger by two methods speaking to the person working the drive through that day and from Bill's order, which includes his usual, an iced tea with lemon, as well as a watermelon slushy, something that the family says Bill would never order for himself. Being that the unidentified passenger has never come forward with any information, we make the leap and assume he either has information about what happened or he was directly involved. Unfortunately, we don't know who this person is, where they met Bill, or how they ended up in the passenger seat of his truck that day. His sister asserts that Bill wasn't the type to give rides to hitchhikers, nor would he allow a stranger in the truck to begin with. Honestly, the whole situation with the passenger gives me flashbacks to episode 234, The Disappearance of Stephen Adams, which happens just one county over and also involves a mysterious passenger who has never been identified. Not to say the cases are related, but what the hell is going on with giving people rides in Oklahoma? What happens after Sonic is almost anyone's guess, but we know Bill arrived home at some point that evening. This is confirmed when police locate his empty Sonic cup, although I've never seen anything to confirm how they know that's the cup from that day and not a cup from a previous day, but I digress. Reportedly, the trailer was in disarray and looked like a mess on the inside, but police find no signs of a struggle, no blood or body fluids, nothing to suggest a violent crime occurred. This goes the same for Bill's shed and both of his trucks. Presumably, the crime scene was either somewhere else entirely or it was outside where not much is going to be left a month later. Initially, detectives develop a theory. The position of Bill's trailer in Lot 104 was, according to a map provided by the trailer park, directly across the road from a thick wooded area which functioned as somewhat of a natural divide between the park and farms and private residences off Allen Road to the north. So, it's thought that Bill might have either been forced or tricked into walking into that wooded area and was either killed or otherwise dispatched there, or perhaps further along towards the Canadian River. The closest I can approximate the river being to Bill's home is about half a mile, which isn't exactly an impossible walk, but if done in the dark at night, could be somewhat difficult and certainly out of the way. Originally, investigators seemed fairly certain that Bill had likely been killed down by the river, at which point his body was placed in the water, or he was left or buried somewhere along the shoreline. What exactly led them to this belief is uncertain. So whether they had something pointing that way or it was just a solid theory, we don't know. Either way, they did bring cadaver dogs around the property, through the woods, and along the riverbanks without any indications. But as we've seen in many cases previously, regardless of how thorough a search is claimed to have been, things are still missed. Personally, I struggle to understand how anything could have happened at the trailer park without someone hearing or seeing something. Those trailers are placed within 15 feet of one another, and this was a warm July night where you'd expect some folks to be outside or to have their windows open, perhaps. Short of this having been done in the late night or early morning hours, I struggle to accept it was carried out without anyone noticing something. Hell, we don't even have any statements from neighbors to say they saw anyone at Bill's home that night or ever. It's all very strange. So then there's the other possibility, that the crime doesn't happen at the park, but somewhere else entirely. 
Maybe Bill is giving a ride home to his unidentified companion when he's ambushed. Or perhaps he had previously made plans to meet with someone or get together. Either way, there's not much to analyze because he could have gone to, been lured to, or been forced to almost anywhere. Now, if he took one of his own trucks, someone had to bring it back before later stealing it and the other truck, which doesn't make much sense to me. And maybe that's the big issue with this case. What makes more sense? That two suspects do something to Bill and steal his truck simultaneously that night, or based on the neighbor's statements, that after the crime is perpetrated, the suspects return to the trailer park on two separate days, on two separate occasions, approximately a week apart, and steal the trucks independent of one another? Honestly, there's a part of me that's always wondered if the truck thefts might even be unrelated. Maybe someone simply noticed Bill hadn't been home. There was no activity on his property. They assume he's out of town on work, and they start stealing equipment, and eventually they take both trucks. Sadly, with as little as has been determined, there's no way to know for certain that the trucks are actually related to what happened to Bill. The Jeep is found first, approximately six days after Bill's reported missing in the parking lot of the Brookwood Village Apartments, about 20 miles north of the trailer park. The Chevy, found a year later, is in the East Lake Village Apartments. This area is just shy of three miles south of Brookwood Village and approximately 16 miles north of Bill's trailer. Both of these complexes are in what is considered South Oklahoma City, and there don't appear to be any direct connections between any of these spots and what is known of Bill's life. Whether or not the suspects dumped the vehicles there purposefully and according to a plan, or if they simply selected these lots at random, is also unknown. Now, the only other way we have to really track any probable locations is through Bill's credit card. Unfortunately, the ping data on his phone is just too broad and offers up a radius of six miles surrounding Goldsby, in which his phone was last used, and that's essentially a needle in a haystack. But what's interesting is to watch where the credit card is used. On the 12th, two days before the missing persons report, it's used at a gas station and a steakhouse in Norman. Both locations are little more than five miles north of Bill's trailer. Then, proceeding north by way of 60th Avenue Northwest, that road eventually becomes Southwestern Avenue, and the East Lake apartment complex is approximately 10 miles from the steakhouse. Less than three miles north is the Brookwood Village Apartments. Then, there's the final credit card use at the Home Depot, which is just two miles north of Brookwood. I understand it may sound a little confusing, but basically you could leave Bill's house and along the way you'd hit the gas station, the steakhouse, East Lake, Brookwood, and the Home Depot without much trouble. I-35 runs parallel to Southwestern Avenue and is likely faster as well, but you could take either route. It certainly seems like all the evidence is traveling north, suggesting the likelihood that your suspect or suspects have some connection to Oklahoma City or at least the southern portion of it. There's a lot of questions presented here that have never been answered. Why take both trucks in the first place if you're just planning to abandon them and not chop them out for parts or make some money off of them? Why go out of your way to dump them at apartment complexes when there's two airports and several strip malls along the way? Maybe to buy more time, maybe to cause confusion, or maybe it's all just random. Now, it's believed Bill had cash on him, and his killers likely took that from him in addition to likely selling off much of his expensive painting gear and equipment. All of that combined should have been a pretty decent haul of between three and $5,000. But if this was all about money, as most crimes often are, why didn't they go for more? We know Bill had over $7,000 in his bank account at the time, so why didn't they take him to an ATM and force him to withdraw more money? Or, you know, force him to hand over the pin to his debit card? It seems odd to be using his credit card when you could have just tried to get all the cash that night and then have left no paper trail at all. The credit card is really a confounding aspect of the case. Police have never specified any charges on the card after the 19th and before August 11th. Instead, all the charges they note occur on the 12th and 13th, which seems strange to me. Stealing someone's credit card, you're likely to assume that it's going to be reported missing or when Bill fails to send in his payment that month, it's going to be cut off. So why wait nearly a month to start using it? 
We know the last transaction occurs the day before the police are called to the home. And at that point, it's theorized that whoever was using the card was either watching Bill's property or had someone in the park keeping an eye out for them. Hell, I'd wager it's entirely possible someone living there at the time of the crime knows a hell of a lot more than they've ever shared with police, but I digress. So you've got this credit card, which you know is either directly connected to a homicide or maybe you're someone who it just got passed to as a hot card and you're unfamiliar with the crime. You're still going to know you're using that stolen card. So what are you going to do with it? Buy a bunch of expensive clothes? Get some sweet stereo equipment? No. You go to a gas station convenience store, a steakhouse, and a Home Depot. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I find that incredibly bizarre. Of all the ways to use that stolen card, and it's in these basic, kind of stupid, almost like you want to be caught ways. Yet, he isn't caught. Because despite all of the video and pictures in the composite, not one person calls in to identify him. I find it remarkably difficult to believe that no one in the area knows who he is. Clearly, someone, and likely more than one person, are keeping things to themselves. So again, we go back to the question at the beginning. Was this a crime committed by strangers or by people who knew Bill? If it was people who knew him, and they were able to lure him into some kind of a trap, or who knows? Maybe something just went wrong and there was a big incident, and in the end, they turned on Bill. Either way, they have to be local. Bill didn't appear to keep in close contact with a lot of people, and of those he did, they were in the Oklahoma area. So if he knew them, I'm not sure how they wouldn't be local. Even if by some chance they weren't, they sure seem to possess a strong knowledge of the area, and frankly, if I'm not from there, then I'm certainly not hanging around a month later still using this guy's credit card. It just makes no sense. A lot of the problem in this case is motive, in that we don't have one. Sure, it could be robbery. Money's one of the oldest motives in the book. I could buy that a little more easily if the trucks had never been found and the credit card wasn't used on stupid little purchases. Usually, if you're going to rob someone, it's to get a lot of easy cash fast whether it's to buy drugs or pay off a debt or some other reason you might be driven to commit such a crime. It just doesn't make sense in my head that you'd kill this man, steal his valuables, take his cash, steal his credit cards, and then go to a gas station convenience store to buy stuff. Then again, it's entirely possible that the suspects here are fucking idiots. I tend to lean a little bit more towards the suspects knowing Bill because, well, the man lived a pretty closed off life. I'm not sure how strangers would not only come to know where he lives, but also be of the opinion that this is someone worth robbing and maybe even killing for what he has. The Craigslist post is interesting in this regard. When Bill advertised his need for a painting assistant, did he get a lot of calls? How much did he share about himself? Might he have come across as a good potential victim? It's hard to say, but given his family and investigator statements that he had a tendency to flash his cash around, Almost anyone could have seen him as a potential mark. The problem I run into is we know nothing happened at the trailer. So either you rob him somewhere else and then what? You use his driver's license to determine where he lives and then you take a shot at showing up there assuming no one will notice? That's a hell of a bold move. At the end of the day, you can talk yourself round and round in circles trying to find a thread of logic in this messed up, broken puzzle of a case. It is infuriating, and mostly because we're missing parts of the story. I know police always hang on to certain details, but they're either hanging on to a lot of them here, or they don't have the answers either. We know the last call made on Bill's phone is 5 p.m., but what time did he go to Sonic? It's never stated. There's an ATM receipt and surveillance footage at the bank. What time did he go there? Was he alone? It's not said. We know he went to a paint store in Norman and spent around $3,000. What did he buy? When did he go? Was he with anyone? Was this normal for him to do? Again, we simply don't know. I think at the end of the day, it's quite clear that Bill was the victim of foul play. Whether people he knew or total strangers, he was likely killed for his money and then his killers took his trucks and sold off his equipment and went on with their lives looking for their next victim. Unfortunately, I believe 
This case is unlikely to break open until someone either identifies the man in the surveillance photos or some piece of evidence taken by police eventually matches someone. It's been nearly 13 years now since Bill Shipley mysteriously vanished and police seem no closer to providing any answers nor naming a suspect. Someone out there has the answers. Someone out there could provide this family with the information they need to bring their son and brother home to give him a proper burial. For some reason, these people haven't come forward yet, but one never knows what might change tomorrow. Without someone doing what's right, new evidence being discovered, or an outright confession, the disappearance of Bill Shipley will remain open, unsolved, and growing colder. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Bill Dwayne Shipley, there honestly aren't a lot of great sources out there. For this episode, the most reliable sources were The Daily Oklahoman and News on Six. If you have any information about the disappearance of Bill Dwayne Shipley, please contact the McLean County Sheriff's Office at 405-527-2141. His case is number 011-0814. Zero three five. You can also contact Oklahoma City Crime Stoppers at 405-235-7300 or by visiting their website at okccrimetips.com. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. Just a quick reminder, if you're planning to attend CrimeCon this year in Nashville from May 31st through June 2nd, use promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com to save 10% on your pass. That's promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com. Now, I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers, without whom Trace Evidence would not be possible. A massive thank you to Andrew Guarino, Ann M. Bertram, Camelia Tyler, Christine Greco, Danny Renee, Denise Dingsdale, Desiree Laro, Donna Buttram, Diani Dyson, Jennifer Winkler, Justin Snyder, Kara Moreland, KY, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B., Lisa Hobson, Madison Lahoulier, Melissa Brekhuizen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Roberta Jansen, Ruth, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Tom Radford, and Wend Organ. I want to thank you all so much for your support. It means the world to me, and you are truly the lifeblood of this podcast. If you're interested in supporting the show and listening to your episodes ad free please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or click the support option on the official website at trace-evidence.com. This concludes our look into the 2011 disappearance of Bill Shipley, a frustrating yet extremely solvable case. If only someone out there with information could find it in their heart to come forward. You can even submit that information anonymously. You don't have to put your name on the line. I want to thank you all again for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.